Well, hello, everybody. What's up? It's your host, Stephen Satani, from the Comedy Advice Podcast, sporting a cap today, a hat, if you will. And while my lovely locks are cascading out the back so beautifully in their lustrous way, the front is all tucked in the cap. So it looks like I've got a mullet. This is kind of weird. I'm tilting it to the side. I don't know what to do with it. It's real weird. Now I look like I'm 14 years old with the beard shaved and the the cap. But I maybe it's because I am coming at you with a youthful spirit. My spirit is young and it has no wrinkles on the inside of it, except for that one time that my brother pushed me down the stairs and called me a dum-dum. And that really scarred me. So maybe there's a little crow's foot of a wrinkle in my soul. But other than that, it's youthful as a juicy little boy. I don't know why I called him juicy. Maybe it's because they're just so full of that Welch's grape juice as my mother used to feed me, along with the Capri Suns. Yeah, lots of Capri Suns. There's so many juices that I used to drink when I was a boy that I don't drink now. Now it's just beer and water and wine, which I guess is technically a, a, an old man's grape juice. But other than that, I mean, I'm pretty juice deprived. How are you guys doing with juice? Are you all juiced up? Hopefully, metaphorically, you are, because... I have a treat of an episode for you guys today. And guess what? It's a midweek episode. And you guys are like, whoa, how are we getting so blessed with all this content juice? Well, I keep plucking fruits. These fruits keep coming to me. And this fruit this week is Charlie Barron's. I don't know if he wants me to call him a fruit, but he's my sweet little grape. And I squeezed him for all the juice that he had. And man, was it tasty. You guys are about to experience it for yourself. I really respect Charlie as a human being. Uh, I don't respect him as a comedian. No, I'm kidding. I respect him as everything. But it's really cool because he started off in, in um, high school and college. He wanted to be a musician, but then he got into journalism and broadcasting. He got hired by MTV for a campaign in his state for the, the, I think it was the presidential elections. And he ended up doing that. He had a very thick accent because he, he's from Wisconsin. So he, as he got more jobs, he, he moved to Dallas and was working for the news there. And they told him, hey, you got, got to get rid of your accent. And which is interesting for a Texan to say to anybody else, but that, that's how it went down. And he tried to get rid of his accent, but it ended up turning out that when he embraced it, at a stand-up show and really got into a character and said everything his vocal coach told him not to do when he truly was able to get those juicy laughs. And he ended up doing the Manitowoc Minute. Still does it, I believe, but it's, uh, it, it was a hit. This viral news show where he took on this character that's very, very from the Midwest and just puts a Midwest twist on news and events and everything. And it's spouted. This juice dribbled down the chin of entertainment in multiple ways where he does sketches. And one of my favorites is Dad's at Target where he and some other comedians, they ended up doing this sketch. I'll put his link in the show notes along with many, many more, many more. He is just a big old his comedy is like cheese curds. You can never get enough and he keeps making them. So it's an abundance. And all you got to do is follow him and link will be in the show notes to follow him. You can also pre-order his book, the Midwest survival guide, which we talked a little bit about. It's amazing. And I think it'll be today as I'm recording today, he is going to be at CB live in Phoenix, but I believe it's sold out. But if you're in any other areas, go check out his tour dates and go to a date, go on a date with Charlie. I like 300 other people. It'll be an interesting date and he'll do a lot of the talking, but you'll just sit there and laugh and you'll be enchanted and you'll love it. And he'll leave you, but he will also leave you with souvenirs, AKA all those fun one-liners and punchlines, setups, twists. It'll be a roller coaster of a ride for you. You won't regret it. And speaking of roller coasters, if you mosey on down 
to Phoenix town. I've got several dates coming up, guys. I know I've been talking about my trash or treasure show on the 9th of November. It's numero trace for all of you listening that also speak Spanish. And it's going to be a good one. Got a killer lineup. We just got it set up. We just got the flyer. We've got some past guests on Bubba McComb. I think he was episode 99. Mo from the Mo Show, Alt AZ 933 amazing person and she also has a podcast go follow her go show her some support as well as some other comedic gems all treasures and it's going to be an amazing time so you should go on over and you can help participate if you're an audience member you're going to help us decide what's trash and what's treasure these comedians fates are in your hands because you decide if they win or lose so however well in you they're in your throats they're their fates are in your throats because you're going to be saying, ah, it's trash, ah, it's treasure, however you want to express yourself. So that's where it's going to be. And I want you to bring your throats to the show. And I want your throats to be as relaxed as possible before that, because there's going to be a lot of yelling and screaming and debate. And it's going to be in a fun way. It's going to be so fun. We have had zero knife fights as of now. So zero accidents in the workplace, and it's been great. No, we've had zero knife fights, period. We don't bring knives. The sharp points that we bring to the table are from our tongues and minds. So that's how it works over here at Trash or Treasure. And I don't know if I'll have a link in the show notes, but you can follow me at S. Chitani on Instagram, and I will keep you abreast of all the updates and when it's coming out. And also, Stefan Satani it has another show on the 12th of november in chandler i believe it's improv mania again follow me at Estatani for more updates and all the breast updates that you can possibly find and it's going to be an improv challenge and i've got a team it's going to be two teams against each other and i'm captain i'm like captain america finally i wanted to be captain america for so long people when i had my hair cut it was a little bit shorter with the non-cascading locks when they were just up and tight just like my 20 year old body now my 30 year old body it's less it's gone back to juicy if i'm being honest with you i was a juicy boy and then i was a dry toned man and now i'm a juicy man so it's just i'm like a a fat steak Mm, just put on the grill just right and I'm a meaty delight is what I am. And anyway, so I'm going to be captain of this team and I'm going up against my co-host, the Trash or Treasure, Lamar Mitchell Jr. And we are going to have a fantastic time. Lamar Mitchell Jr., big shout out to him too. If you guys have not followed him yet, follow him on social media. We just filmed a sketch, him, me, and... Uh, Joe Audio. Man, how could I forget that name? Joe Audio, who is also a phenomenal person. Follow him. Listen to his latest album and his latest track that's a hit, Orchata in My Cup. Yeah. Oh, dude, it's a sick beat. And Orchata is a sick drink. So drink that while you're doing it. Bring your Orchata everywhere. That's what I think you should be doing. Did you guys know it's a non-dairy beverage? No? It was actually, I looked this up because in Wikipedia, Wikipedia says in Spain, they actually just soaked water in tiger nuts, which I'm not talking about tiger testes here, people. Keep your mind out of the gutter. I'm talking about actual tiger nuts. Well, non-actual tiger, you know, the, like Brazil nuts. And I'm not talking about like Pele's nuts, but, you know, those Uh, legumes i guess you would call them all right getting off topic here i think we're ready for the episode don't you is there anything else oh if you guys haven't please leave a review subscribe uh the reviews are really helpful they allow me to buy cool things like this hat and my adidas shirt they don't help me at all they just help my self-esteem and so i don't buy things that i think can validate me further like this hat but should i do it backwards i feel like backwards might be better yeah now i look real cool i look like i need a skateboard now and trying to do kick flips and spray painting and graffitiing the neighbor's house okay all right well i think that is all guys so thank you so much for everything you do i really appreciate you guys i think about you guys a lot and you know i, I feel like 
I need to text you sometimes so late at night. I'm a little drunk. I'm extra juicy. And I'm thinking, should I? Should I send like a you up? And I almost come in here and I turn on the, the mic and I record. And I go, hey, guys, I miss you. It's been too long. You haven't left any reviews. What's going on? Is it me? Is it something I said? And I, I end up in the next morning, I don't send it. I delete it. I'm sorry. But now that I told you about it, I guess it's kind of out there in the airwaves. So I just wanted to say I love you guys so much. So much. And thank you for everything you do. All right. Here comes Charlie Barron's, everybody. Here we go. Hey. Hey, Charlie. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Top of the morning or bottom of the morning. I'm not sure which part of the morning it is for you. It's what, 10 a.m. over there? Yeah. What time is it for you? 9 a.m.? No, it's 8 a.m. Oh, you're in LA. I'm in Arizona. Oh, they have that they have that thing then with the time zones where you guys don't care about daylight savings. Exactly. We don't care what time it is when we ride into the sunset. So we just stick it as it normally is and we don't mess with it. That's just how we roll. Or Gallup. Yeah. I'm not sure. I admire that about Arizona. What's the rationale? Is that a Democrat thing? Is that a Republican thing? Who's saying F it to the time man, you know? <laughs> I, you know, I'm actually not sure. I had to ask my pops about it because there, we had this conversation and I was telling him about how it was frustrating when I was working and trying to schedule meetings with other people in every other state i'd have to be like okay november it's two hours ahead in new york and uh november through march and then after that it's only it's three and he was like yeah we did it when i was a kid back in the 60s or 70s and i he didn't say which political party or or why i, I think he said people just i guess we're we're at that spot in the equator where it doesn't really change that much Oh, okay. So there's a there's a geographic reason why. Yeah, I was quite surprised. I went to a to a wedding in Idaho, and so I was there, really close to Yellowstone. So we got to experience the joys of all different flora and fauna. But another surprising thing: we went there in the summer, and it didn't the sun didn't set until 10 p.m. ish, which was crazy. Because in Arizona, it sets maybe maybe eight o'clock latest. In the summer. Yeah, in Wisconsin, I think the latest that I'll get is uh, 845, you know, something like that. Oh, okay. Okay. 10 is new to me, though. 10, I mean, that's like an Ireland thing. Uh, my experience from Ireland is that like that. Yeah, yeah. That's, I was surprised too. I guess Idaho, we weren't too high up. And I mean, we were by Wyoming, which now we're testing my geography skills. But if you just go to the right, Wisconsin, like, you know, Montana is, is Wisconsin as high as Montana or is it lower? Um, sure. I, I'm never sure because sometimes if you look at a map, they're somewhat deceiving with the lines of longitudinal, what have you, you know, but it's yeah. close, you know? Well, beautiful. I, and you know what? I see a glimmer of light. It looks like the sun is rising on this episode of a Comedy <laughs> Advice podcast. Yes. I didn't even get to introduce myself. My name is Stefan Sitani, and I will be your host. I guess that would be weird if I just walked away and another host came in. But uh, it's a pleasure <laughs> to meet you, Charlie. And for all of those listening that just walked in and didn't just blindly picked an episode, you guys might be hearing that wonderful voice that isn't mine. It's got a little bit of a Midwestern, I don't want to say twang, but a little sing-songy um, fluctuation. You know, you just call it the, the molasses on, on, the, uh, on the rhubarb bread. Honest to Pete is what we cut the maple syrup on your venison, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> That's what that is. Right there. That the yeah. delicious the garnish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The beautiful, the beautiful sweetening of all of these letters in the English alphabet. Um, he's and he's also, you are also such a talented person. I think I just might have to call you a guy because you do sketches, you were a journalist, you did music. Um you're a comedian. You do everything. Jack of all trades, master of none. That's the deal. You see in every, all these different trades, you see an extreme lack of confidence in any one particular trade. So that's what you got. <laughs> that's what you got. I, 
I I might uh, disagree there because everything I've seen you in, you've been absolutely phenomenal. And I, I also I started doing some research on you. Humble beginnings from suburbs in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, from twelve children. Uh, mm-hmm. family you were yeah, raised. one in twelve. Yeah, which is pretty amazing. And you were the second born out of the twelve. Yes, second oldest. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually, my brother just had a kid uh, this morning or late last night or something. So that's now now they get grandkids. You know, my mom's like a third base coach. Just, you know, tell them, keep going, keep going. Just call them all in. <laughs> no, I need more like grandkids. Don't, don't want kids. <laughs> need more grandkids. That is great. I was going to ask, too. I mean, out of 12 children, who did all the cooking? How was the food situation. Yeah, food situation is wonderful because my mom, uh, I believe after the first one or two, she, you know, she had always wanted to have a big family. So she decided to leave her job and she, uh, you know, she really, really did the um, the full-time mom thing, which when there's Mm -hmm. 12 of you, it's a, that job's not something I wish upon my worst enemy, you know, especially us, we weren't well-behaved kids, you know, we were little hell raisers. And, um, so, but she, she's awesome. Yeah. Oh, oh she great. did the cook. She cooked though. She cooked. And then, you know, she, she teach us to cook some of us, some of us with be- better, uh, results than others. I had poor results mostly. So <laughs> what, and may I ask with the, you mentioned, um, syrup on venison and some other tasty mm. delicacies that really intrigued me but i've never tried is that the type of food that you guys had what were some typical baron's dishes well definitely casseroles big casserole family um not a hot yeah. dish i was something else but uh we had it on occasion um lasagnas anything crock pot stuff you know um anything you could put in a pot and have it cook while you're chasing around two kids in diapers and one smoking pot around the corner. Um, you know, that's the age range of their diapers to first time pot smokers. So, uh, you know, any, any, I, any meal, but she made fantastic meals, Ch- chicken, like, uh, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, I'm not thinking of the right, she, if she's ever listened to this, she'd be like, I made you this and that and that. Where were those? You chose the crock pot thing I made and, and casserole, you know, these, you know, so she made. I have an interview with her right that. afterwards so she can fill that in and I'll just put that in. Good. Post. I'm glad you're doing your research there. You're getting more than one source <laughs> for this. That's good. Uh- Oh, that's great. And then I know that you would also, when you had gotten into school, you were interested in being a musician, which I think later that was percolating and later became developed as the Unthawed album, which yeah. hit hit the top charts in bluegrass and comedy, which I wanted to talk about in a second. But you decided to veer away from that and go into broadcast journalism, which was interesting. Why did you end up changing well, courses? Timeline's a little the the album actually i only did that um recently right last year last year so the my path was i did yeah. journalism and um oh you're asking why i veered off journalism path because i sucked at it you know i mean i i was okay <laughs> i you know I, but i i said words wrong and like i got you know i, I wasn't great on air you know and mm-hmm. uh i also didn't want to do it that bad You know, I local news when I was doing it. And to this day, local news, unless it's a really good station, it's it's kind of not great um, because it's a lot of regurgitating national news stories in order to fill a newscast because all these local news stations, many of them, not all of them, many of them, uh, you know, have cut out the investigative uh, arm. And they've cut out the local uh, hits where people are going to the, uh, like, you know, the meetings, uh, the, the, the neighborhood meetings, the. Um, uh, oh, geez, like the council I'm meetings losing, or the, the council meetings. I'm losing, I'm losing all my words today, but you know, those things that really impact the community instead, at least this was a thing at the station I was working at. It, more yeah. of the emphasis was getting on um, sort of clickbaity type stories, things to drive up web traffic, um, 
And consequently, you just have you you have not great news going on out there. So I, anyway, I didn't want to be in it. So I went and I did. Um, also, I wasn't good at it. You know, mind you that. And, and then I went and started doing uh, comedy. I, I was producing um with Fo like 20th century fox not like fox news but like the the entertainment arm of them so i was producing some new stuff for them which would go out to all the local news channels didn't like doing that uh because i was basically editing you know and uh and then i started doing comedy at night so interesting and it, you know, I don't think you had to have been that bad because I know you got an Emmy for the cost of water, which uh -huh. is a very interesting news segment. And I, I also I think it's really cool. I know you were talking about how you were editing at, at one point. And I think your first job was for MTV in junior year of college, where it was the choose choose or lose campaign. Yeah, and you got selected for Wisconsin, and and I know you picked up a lot of those skills that you might be using today, or your team that you're directing that helps you with a, a lot of your productions are using today. And I I wanted to ask a little bit about that in terms of what what did you learn there that you feel has been crucial for you as you've been getting into comedy, as you've been making these hit sketches and stuff that you might not see other people doing that you'd be like, hmm, you know what, it'd be nice if they polished it off, poured a little dollop of, of syrup on that venison of a meaty sketch that they're they're doing. <laughs> Uh, well, I think, I think you're, first of all, I love that analogy. That's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> you, you tied it all together with the meaty sketch. I, I was, <laughs> at first I was like confused and I was like, oh no, this is a beautiful tie up of a, of a, this is a beautiful tie up of an analogy, which is also a callback. Well played. Um, I, I, I didn't know where I was going with it. Actually. I was just no, carving you, away you and fought then... through it. You fought through it and you got it and you landed the plane. And it's always hardest to land the plane, you know? Very, very uh, true. Oh, God. <laughs> so, no, but I, I think the MTV job, honestly, was the best thing that happened to me early in my career, One, you know, um, yeah. because what it did is it gave me an opportunity to shoot, edit, write, and be the on-camera person. Mm -hmm. um, it gave me that opportunity because they were too cheap to pay for anyone else. You know, I mean, this was the, <laughs> the heyday, the advent of one man bands, you know, which be, uh -huh. have become a mainstay in local news since then. But this is 2008, you know, so I'm kind of old, but this is right when the, um, right when Twitter first became a thing, like I got arrested. Um, I got arrested in St. Paul, Minnesota, covering the Republican National Convention protests. And mm -hmm. I think the, the way they found out was because I tweeted about it. But back then, we had the flip phones, the old burners, you know? Oh, and, yes. And so you would you would text it, and then you would do hashtag 88-something, and then it would send to Twitter if you use this hashtag, and you set up your phone with it. So you would, you would, be, you would old school text it, like your thing, and then it would go up. I don't know why I'm bringing this up, but anyway, that's MTV's where I started learning how to shoot, edit, produce. And I did it on a weekly basis. And I think that's the most um, important thing for anybody. Really, I think any um, comedian, frankly, I know many comedians will disagree with this and that's OK. Mm -hmm. But I think the easiest way to get up on stage is to build a following on the Internet because clubs don't really care how great or awful you are at comedy. If you have a following, you'll book a tour, a one tour, one tour. If it sucks, that may be the last tour you book. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, all those skills helped me create the co comedy videos that um, helped me become an actual touring stand-up comedian, as opposed to a guy who is doing open mics, you know, doing mm -hmm. the belly room bringer shows, and and I paid everybody to, to, you know, I paid for everybody's tickets, you know? So that's where I was. And then the videos took off and then I, I was headlining just like that. And I was not a headliner, you know, I had to really grow into that role, but it's amazing how quickly you can grow into that role if you get that much stage time, you know? So, yeah. 
And, and what a be- what a delicious casserole of an answer that was, because I felt like there were so many ingredients that we can savor. One of which is going tough. back to the whole. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just and I love the analogy out. continuation, and we all know a casserole is just something you throw a bunch of shit in, and it tastes good because you <laughs> added a lot of butter. You know, don't tell my mom that. Don't tell my mom that. <laughs> <laughs> it's an art. No. It's an art. And I'm not talking about my mom's casserole. Those were magnificent <laughs> and well crafted. Sorry, mom. Oh man. No. Mama Barons will hear no such thing. We'll keep our lips sealed. But I think that as we're feasting on it, the first thing to mention is back to the Twitter thing. I mean, God, I'm glad they put a stop to that because all the texts that I see, some of them have the hashtags included. And if one of those just you got a hashtag and it just signals up to the Twitter verse. I think a lot of people might be exposed in ways that they would not want to be. Some oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Walk, no, walking I, in naked. I don't know if I'm explaining that right. You would hit the, it wasn't even called a hashtag. I'm old enough uh, to tell you when a hashtag was called a pound sign. And, but you would do the pound sign on your phone and then some numbers, and that would send it up to the Twitter first. Did I explain oh, that right? That's how you would okay. send it. Oh, you would te- or you or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you would text a number that they gave you, and that would be your Twitter account that you were texting, and basically would pop it up there. Honestly, I can't really trust my memory, so you might have to Google <laughs> this for actual verification. I've done some damage to the old brain cells over the years, so. No, hey, you know what? That's okay. Sometimes I like leaving things a mystery. And maybe we should bring that back where a lot of people are so quick to tweet that maybe they would need an an additional barrier where they're like, hmm, maybe this isn't the best thing to send out into the world. Yeah. But in in terms of sending things, go ahead. No, no, I was going to (laughs) say, I was going to say that that's a tough one. Some people, they build their livelihood off being the first and the funniest. And uh, and I, I used to try and do that. And, um, but yeah. man, I hate be, being tied to the news like that. You know, when you're, when your whole thing is like doing jokes about the news, it's always yeah. like, oh God, what did he say? Ah, looks like I'm working tonight, you know? So, oh. but some people love it and that's cool. That's great. Yeah, yeah, very true. And another thing that you said that you touched on was a lot of comedians might not like this, but a way to be able to get tushies and seats and to be able to headline is to get big on the internet. And I've seen a lot of really pe- really good people. Um, I've had a couple on the podcast, Jason Banks, who is has a huge following on TikTok, Ryan Kelly as well, where they are very talented comedians and they were able to get that success and be able to, I don't think it's skipping the line really, because you're putting in such hard work at being able to be be big and, and uh, get a following. So I think it's just an alternate path. It's just like, you know, Frodo, instead of walking all that way to Mordor, he builds a plane and then flies there and then <laughs> drops the ring right in there. So I, it's still yeah. a lot of work, but yeah, just the a whole different skip, path. Right. The, the whole skipping the line thing is just, I, th- that's frustrating, I think, when, when I hear like, oh, he skipped the line or whatever. And yeah. I've heard it, I'm sure it's been said about me, but I've heard it said about other um, comedians, but I'm like, that's assuming that that's like assuming that there is a line. You know what I mean? That's assuming that right. you think that that is in place. Like it used to be, it used to be you pay your dues, you work at the comedy store, you know, but the, you work the door, you work your way up, you get on stage. But that was the 80s, you know? I mean, and you're right. It's like saying, like, oh, uh, he's skipping the line because, you know, he's getting directions on on his phone instead of printing them off MapQuest, you know, of course I could get there quicker <laughs> if I print it off the, but I got, I got knocked off the route. I had to get gas and then it didn't tell me on MapQuest. I had to go print new directions at the Holiday Inn. So of course he got here <laughs> earlier, you know? So, I mean, it's like, are you skipping the line or are you just, are you staying up with the game that's being played? And the unfortunate reality and I think it's unfortunate because I think there are a lot of amazing stand-up comedians out there that aren't getting the attention they deserve. But the game no longer is stand-up comedy, um, really. I, that's not the job anymore. The job is is 
finding uh, some platform of whereby you can sell tickets and the fun it, it is stand up. It's almost like actors. They say the job isn't acting. The job is auditioning. It's like the shitty thing that you have to do in order to do what you actually love, you know? And I think if people think of it more like that, maybe there'd be less animos animosity toward, you know, um, toward the game, I guess, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely agree to that. And I feel like the, there's still so much work that's being put in and and I like your the way that you phrased it where it's like it's not just stand-up comedy uh, there's so much more to it and it's not all about stand-up anymore it's about those little moments being where people are essentially and people usually they're consuming on their phones or they're consuming stuff on their on their um a desktop or laptop or whatever and so being there and being able to give them a little bit of joy in that moment is a beautiful thing. And I feel like the sketches that I've seen of yours have been so good, so dynamic as well. I just recently enjoyed a little morsel of yours where you were talking about where do cheese, where does cheese curd day come from? Oh, yeah. You did this 60 minutes investigative uh, thing where you ended up going to Culver's like several yeah. times and asking yeah, yeah. about where cheese curd day came from. Um, yeah. The dads at Target where you and um, oh my gosh, I feel really bad for not remembering their oh, names. Oh, Miles so. Taylor Penn, those fellas. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, guy, you betcha guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you guys all got together and uh, you ended up creating this sketch where you were talking about the dads of Target where your wives would go in and you guys were so sick of just going in with them and shopping all the time that you guys ended up creating this nice safe space where you guys could watch football and uh, and <laughs> do all these cool things in, in the car and hang out. And it was so freaking funny with the kind of uplifting music and yeah. Uh, it, it, that was, was dude so dad's weird. brainchild, and uh, and I was thrilled that he brought us in for for the ride on that one because I re I remember when he pitched that idea to me, I was like, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> and then uh, we got there and we started shooting it, and he, you know, we all improved in it, and and but for, I mean, he he did an incredible job crafting that. He's he's a talented guy, very talented. Great improv background too, uh, and all those guys are funny, um, very funny. Miles and and uh, Penn as well, uh, it, you know. So it's it's cool to collaborate like, like that with those guys. Yeah, it, it is really cool, and it's so cool. I know you mentioned the improv too. A lot of the lines that you guys had were so just these little quips that made me giggle, and the, yeah. some of the story points were like it all started with Charlie just asking if you wanted to try some beef jerky and you just knock <laughs> on one of their windows and you're like, Hey, you want some jerky? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and some then the, the whole, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and yeah. then the, the children, you guys had kids, but it didn't show up until like two minutes in and you're like, yeah, we figured out this system where they're just in the car now and we've got security cameras and right. it fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. We had a lot of fun doing that one, man. Mm. And and another thing that I also wanted to bring up was this wonderful accent of yours that just I feel it's contagious and I feel it spreads joy. It, you know, there are some accents that don't. Unfortunately, the New Jersey accent, it might not spread joy, but the the Midwest accent, I feel it's just very cheery and uplifting. And one of the things that I feel like you've been able to do serendipitously or with full intention is kind of connect the Midwest through this comedy that you have. I know uh, one of the other sketches that I had seen was the Midwest translator that you had. And I felt like it was so brilliant because you were kind of connecting and showing some of the things from what people might say in the Midwest, but you also did it in a way where you were also including people from outside that might not know what uh, tree meant or battery, battery for a clicker. And you had the translator and it kind of translated that. And then we were all in on the joke. And I feel like that's a pretty key piece to explain it. But I feel like a lot of the different things that you do, they're able to spread the word of the Midwest and also bring this kind of solidarity amongst Midwesterners. 
Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that. I actually, um, I've been, I, this isn't a plug, but uh, it's a natural transition. Uh, I just yes. wrote this book, um, The Midwest Survival Guide. And um, part of, you know, I wrote it over the summer and it's, uh, it's, that's the whole idea of that, of uh, that is like, you either know somebody from the Midwest or you're from the Midwest. And so I think everybody's got this kind of connection. And so, you know, it's just a book going through all the things that you need to know when you're there. And a lot of it's uh, kind of universal stuff that everybody can relate to, but then it gets a little bit, it, it gets specific and gets weird here. You know, the culture is weird and uh, the people are weird in a great way. And I, I include myself in that. And so um, it, it was fun to really explore even parts of the culture that I had maybe not known uh, of that well and, and just kind of dove into. And it's kind of like, you know, the Midwest is kind of like that onion that you find in your crisper, you know, that's that started to sprout and whatnot, you know. So you, you pull off the layers. It looks funky, you know, makes you cry sometimes, you know, gives you gives you some indigestion if you have too much of it. But, you know, uh, it's it's a cool <laughs> it's a cool place. And so I'm, I'm lucky to be from there and to like to be able to pick out some of the trees from the forest. Oh, Beautiful. And I know it's available for pre-order coming out November. I can't remember. The oh, exact date, he but... got it, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know when it's coming out. I should know that. Um, and if my agent ever listens to this, uh, she's going to be pissed. I don't know the date coming out sometime in November. But if you pre-order it, that'd be really cool. Uh, great go. Christmas present. Great Hanukkah present, you know, uh, birthday oh. present. It's the perfect book for your crapper. There we go. That's a spiel. <laughs> what a way, what a beautiful way to uh, wipe that. Uh, no, I was trying to go for a metaphor there, but that stunk. So we'll move on. But oh, Link you did is it though. Be... You did it effectively <laughs> twice. That's good. <laughs> well, we'll have a link in the show notes though. So we're going to leave the mystery of when it's actually coming out. But if you click on that link, you can find out and you can pre-order it and get it as a gift for Hanukkah, for Christmas, for, you know, just because if a housewarming gift, if somebody's got a new crapper and you want to be able yeah. to gift them with a it's, nice accessory. It's a crapper warming gift. Forget housewarming. They put in a new toilet. You get it for them. That's actually great. I may have to put that in a video some point that Can I steal a, that joke is that okay oh, if I steal that? oh please it's it's all yours yeah and i mean we could also i could connect you with some of the local plumbers so it's like you get a new toilet and you get a book attached now that's actually deal. not a bad idea that's not a bad idea at all i i yeah. shoot i'm gonna write that down that's <laughs> wonderful um, Every once in a while an right idea there. swirls inside yeah. my brain so hopefully well, you got uh, a bunch of them i can tell <laughs> Well, Charlie, it has been a pleasure learning a little bit about you. A comedy advice podcast. Also, we like to give some advice to random questions that I have found or fans have submitted from the Reddit advice column or other areas that are very, they're silly, usually in nature. We can answer them seriously if you want to or sillily. This is your episode. So yeah. whatever you want to do. Yeah, I'm actually going to plug my computer in so this doesn't... Uh die during the, this portion of the podcast so just two seconds sorry about this Jeez, no no problem i thought you were just walking away and be like yeah i'm actually gonna choose to just leave yeah no, that wouldn't be the midwest way i i uh i'd spend more time apologizing for leaving early than i would just finishing up the thing so you know <laughs> all right no i'm having a great time too so all right oh, let's man. let's do it I as well. All right, we'll get into this first question. It's from Reddit, and it says, should I get a tattoo to look older? I'm almost 30, but most people think I look like a teenager. I have a baby face, and I don't put on muscle. I've been considering getting a tattoo just to signal to people that I'm older. The thing is, I'm very indecisive, so I feel like I might end up regretting whatever tattoo I get later on, and there's nothing in particularly struck on getting tattooed on myself. Opinions. Yeah, uh, if you get a tattoo, will that make you look older? Uh, this isn't, you know, this isn't um, 
I, I don't know when getting a tattoo is like, it, it makes you look forever like 29, you know? <laughs> you know? Like, like at some point you're too old to have tattoos, but you still got them, you know? And it, yeah, it does make you look older if you're like 16 and it's not legal to have one yet. You know, that's usually a pretty good indicator. If they have a tattoo, they're at least 18 or they had their parents' permission. But um, yeah, yeah, I have no tattoos. Um, I've, Likewise. I've, what's that? Likewise. We're both tattooless. Yeah, tattooless. I've never had a strong, I've never had something that I feel like I've, fused my identity to enough to permanently put it on my body um and also they scare me a little bit i've i've had friends get one tattoo and then they get two tattoos and then they get three tattoos i'm like shit there's no way there's five things i want on my body forever so there must be some sort of addictive property to the pain or to the look or to balancing out the the drawings that i'm like i don't want to get into that game plus it's a lot of time to sit somewhere still and i i'm not very good at doing that (laughs) <laughs> and, um, you know, also, uh, so don't, don't get a tattoo. If you want to look older, just start smoking cigarettes. Be smart about it. That, you know what? That's a brilliant solution. I feel like cigarettes, they just really, it's a catalyst for making you go from 30 to 50. It's like yeah. the Tesla of age. It's like zero to Ex- 60 in less than 10 exactly. seconds. Exactly. Exactly. Some about the nicotine and carcinogens and mm, yeah, it's good. Just Start smoking them and really be committed to it. Wake up, have a cigarette, you know, before you take a piss, smoke a cigarette, get that, get that infused into your body. And, and, you know, Philip Morris has spent decades figuring out how to, how to kill you earlier and make and age you earlier. And uh, it's not going to be hard. Once you start, the fun won't stop. So, um, but don't, don't start too hard. Don't go right for the Marby Reds. You know, uh, because then you'll throw up and you won't want to have any again. Start with a P funk, um, you know, some light and nice, and then work your way up to you know a filterless M- Marlboro. Oh, I, did you have you ever smoked before, Charlie? Or are you? Uh, I've I've I have smoked. Um, I enjoy uh, smoking, but I don't do it um, because it gives you wrinkles as the uh as all the doctors will tell you that's the only right. bad side effect is that it gives you wrinkles so. that, that that's what i've heard surgeon general warning is many wrinkles it's just yeah. for a while the, i was smoking it, and moisturizing but I, I just i couldn't afford both the cigarettes and the moisturizer so i just had to quit both you know i think that marlboro if they're not already onto it if they have a marlboro moisturizer while mm. you're smoking that might be that, that's the, best, the ticket the, the combo here but you know i i also did i it was right when i got out of college i went straight for the marlboro reds too it was oh uh, did you oh you smoker you still smoke no no i did quit because i i got to that part where i was like i look 30 now so i stopped but yeah i no, but I ended up, I just stopped because I enjoyed it and I enjoyed it a little too much. And I got to a point where I was like, I'm smoking three or four a day here. So I think this yeah. is starting to get addictive. Right, and- right. Once you start doing that, you're like, am I going to be the guy who who smells all the time and, and who like, right. you know, is dead with heart disease at 62, you know, because I couldn't. Right. Cause I, cause I just wanted to go outside to breathe away from other people. You know, <laughs> that's what a lot of it is too. It's just wanting to get the hell away from people. It's a nice excuse. Exactly. And, and it does look like a really badass breath too, as you just smoke it out. That oh, was yeah. one of the cool things. I felt like yeah. I was part dragon at that point, but. Oh yeah, no, no. super cool. Super cool. Yeah. If, uh, like I said, if it didn't, uh, you know, give you wrinkles, kill you 30 years earlier, that kind of stuff. I'd be doing it every day, all day. Same. I should, I should mention this podcast is sponsored by Marlboro Reds. Oh, thank God. 20% off. Yeah. <laughs> That's perfect. All right. <laughs> moving, moving on to our, uh, I actually have a segment just for you, Charlie. This should be uh-huh. a little quickie, but it's, uh, I know you have the Midwest survival guide. 
I yeah. created a little bit of a Southwest survival guide and I sought out what are some specific Arizona things that we say that similar to a Jeepers or a, a Cripes. And I looked on the internet and I actually, I couldn't find anything. We're just so blended together. We've got some Midwest folks. We've got some people from California, but there was some stuff that uh, I'll I'll try and test you and see if you can think what it if if you can figure out yeah. what it means and then I'll yeah. tell you if we use it or not. Okay. So we there's a term here according to like ten articles written by people that are not from Arizona. <laughs> the uh, this one's called the Big Ditch. Oh, I thought you were going somewhere else with that. Big Ditch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you were like the big deal. Yeah. I'm like, all right, I'm done with this. Like, <laughs> no, whoa, yeah, That's but when you walk out. You're like, okay, we're done. We're done. Yeah, big ditch Grand Canyon. Bingo. Charlie, you yeah. are pretty, pretty good at this. I've okay, been there. Now, Beautiful now, place. Maybe you haven't it's heard. A, one, a true, a true marvel. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's wonderful. I've been there like 17 times because every time my somebody comes in from out of town, we're like, gotta see the big ditch. We don't call it the big ditch. They, yeah. I don't know what we should call it. The the marvelous crack. No, that sounds yeah, like a drug. Marvelous crack is nice. I'll I'll workshop it. All right. Next one is a swamp box. Swamp box. Um hmm. I mean, if I were to say that, I'd probably be a duck blind, you know, for hunting. Oh, I don't, I don't know what a duck blind is. Oh, duck blind is, you know, it's a little it's house. You blind that, the ducks? No, it's a little house in the swamp that you camel up and you wait for the ducks to fly over and you fuck, you murder them, you know? <laughs> you murder them. Yeah, you kill an innocent duck who is just trying to fly, and you go bang, bang, bang. But they taste so good. I'll tell you that. That's why we do it. Also, we're bored, you know? So we like to go find ways to kill innocent creatures. Um, I don't know what a swamp so box is. It, what, what it is a air conditioning unit. Oh, okay. That, 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 that makes sense. That makes sense. We, uh, no, but I've never heard it called a swamp box before. So it was That's new to me. That's got to be a Florida thing, honestly, I think. I think that makes more I sense so. for Florida. Yeah, I agree, because it's not really humid here. Right. I, th I think we'd call it a boxed oasis, uh, perhaps. Yeah, it's just that, that would make more sense. A moment of reprieve. So the next one and last one, oh, well, what is a haboob? Have you heard of that term before? Mm -mm. Hab Never. This is, uh, by the way, it's PG. But the haboob is, I think it's Arabic, but it's the sandstorm that comes in and just blankets the entire city in sand. Sounds terrifying. Yeah. I think I've been there when that's happened, though. Mm, yeah, it's just, it's mildly inconvenient at worst. Yeah. That's basically yeah. what it is. I'm scared of just getting it in my eyes. So I have, I wear protective glasses when I'm out if I have to, but I would say... Stay inside with a swamp box and you should be fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And that's that. Those are the only things I could find from Arizona. How boring is that? You know, I was I was waiting for something else, but the fact that it didn't come. I mean, you know, yeah. I'm, <laughs> that's the nice thing about the Midwest, though, is that you know you you uh, you really appreciate the cultural idiosyncrasies and nuances and weirdness when. You know, you talk to someone from Arizona where they uh, <laughs> where they don't have any, where it's nothing but a big golf course in the middle of a desert, you know? I'm just kidding. We, That's we, not true. No, Arizona no. is beautiful. Flagstaff, uh, been to the, I, I think all the natural uh, beauty in Arizona is incredible, unmatched by dang near anywhere else in the world. I, I hate the golf courses, but, you know, uh, that's because I suck at golf. So there you have it. Same. I mean, going back to your cost of water, I'm sure there is a lot of water involved for the golf courses. I, we have more golf courses per square mile than any other place in the world. No, maybe not world, but the yeah. United States. 
You guys should just so, say forget it and just put a bunch of water parks in the desert instead. You'd probably use less water, you know. <laughs> You're like, yeah, seriously, serious. And you'd think that we like Eskimos, we'd have a hundred different words for golf course, but no, yeah. we're just barren like a desert. No, no life or vocabulary or vernacular here. So anyway, yeah, you well, did it's a great good job. That all that water in the Colorado River. It's good that it ran dry for golf course. Actually, you know what? I do think I don't think that's fair of me to say because I believe that uh, Arizona, uh, Phoenix specifically, has a very good water capture system where it rains a lot there. And and I think I read this. I don't remember where. And someone you know maybe can fact check me. But I think that they found sure. out how to do it, how to save the water that that pours once a year or whatever. Uh, whereas LA oh. has completely messed it up. They just built their city. So all the water rushes into the ocean and they're like, oh, we have water problems, uh, but they get a ton of rain in LA like four days a year if they just captured it instead of sending it back to the ocean. But they'd have to completely rebuild, I think the infrastructure of the city and the city has no money um, because you know it's all, uh, well, I, I don't know why they don't have money. I'm not a politician. I just know they're probably doing it wrong. Good. I, God, let, I'm going to uh, submit let that. The hack little... journalist comedian tell you you're you're doing your city wrong. I could be a hack politician too if I try. You know. I think I was Me. I was ready to sub box that up and submit it for the uh, your next TED talk. That was yeah, pretty, exactly, exactly. I good. read this somewhere once. I don't remember how. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't finish the article, but this was the gist of it. You know. Yes. All right. We've got, we're going to dive into our last question, Charlie, and then we'll bid each other adieu. This last one, it says, I'm a spoiled brat and my dad wants to see how my teeth are doing. I'm going to cut straight to the juicy bits. I haven't been wearing my retainer. There are a few reasons why. The main one is generic mental illness. Oof, not trying to play the pity card. Anyways, my bottom teeth have shifted and I'm scared they'll fall out if I try to put the retainer back on. My dad paid a lot of money to fix my teeth and now he wants to see me wear it because he's noticed I've stopped bringing it to his house. I'm trapped. I want to tell him, but at the same time, I'm scared that he'll be disappointed in me. Please help. There's a yeah, lot to chew I'm on not there. Sure the, I'm not sure why they're not re wearing the retainer. I, I, they, there's a mental health reason why they're not wearing the retainer. That's what it sounded like, but they didn't elaborate on it. Uh, we, we didn't well, really get to sink our teeth into that one. Too. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for entertaining well me. Well done. I think I think that's the be that's the best punchline we're gonna get out of this one. I I got a retainer. I actually have one of the retainers that they uh, they put in, and you don't have to actually wear it, but they put it on the back of your teeth. But that may Same. be uh, that may be a good um, teeth are a funny thing, man. Teeth are a funny thing because you know there's a lot of there's. A lot of gaps in terms of uh, financial ability to uh, do the teeth thing, and that's tough, you know. And but that now they've they're making it cheaper with Invisalign and all that sort of stuff. So I just say go to an orthodontist, and if you got the money, and because um, they have a lot of cheaper ways to do it these days, so something to consider. That's yeah. Hey, that's really true i feel like being you were being very transparent just like a lot of the transparent options like invisalign and um i think sometimes you can overbite financially but uh i think there are those cheap options that allow you to be able to underbite and did we just that. write your 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 top your first five minutes tonight i i your think this five. might be i think i think yeah all about teeth the per, yeah. i'll call it the pearly white five this is there great. you go. There you go. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I think this was a pearly white 45 minutes of entertainment with you, Charlie. Yes, so was. thank you so thank much. You. And, and I wanted to ask, you know, what have you got going on? Where can people find you? What would you like to plug? Yeah, I mean, I think the book, uh, Midwest Survival Guide, is coming out. That's the big thing. And, um, you know, I'm going to be in Arizona. I'm going to be in Phoenix doing some shows. Stand. Um, and uh, other than that, I got other tickets on charliebarons.com if you're around the area. And I really appreciate Beautiful. you having me on. It was fun talking with you. Yeah. And, and yeah, I hope you 
uh, I hope some of these Reddit folks get the advice that we've so expertly given them. So yes. smoke cigarettes I... with Invisalign. The end. <laughs> Beautiful. And that is the episode, everybody. Thank you so much for making it all the way to the end. Thank you for being the Frodo that helped me, well, the Sam, that helped me drop the ring in the fire. And by the ring, I mean Charlie. And by the fire, I mean this episode. Because we did it. I guess that pans out to Charlie being destroyed. But maybe his sense of of caution his inhibitions have been destroyed and he can propel himself even further thanks to this episode so huge thank you to charlie follow him if you haven't yet and don't follow me if you guys haven't yet i'm everywhere i'm all over those social medias and i've got some funny new videos up some new clips i'm experimenting a lot with that this is one of the things that i'm trying to focus on is making new sketches so if You've got any sketch ideas, send them over to me. And also, guys, I just realized this. I've got a link in my show notes to leave video questions or video messages. No, audio messages. That's the right word. So you guys can actually call and leave an audio message, which is really cool. So do that. Send me your questions, however you want to deliver them. Just make sure they're juicy because you know we talked about this. I want mm, that Welch 100% juicy message quality okay all right guys well you guys are my princesses so thank you so much for everything and i hope you have a pleasant moment big old gooch smooch goodbye